Hello everyone, this is Mike Howard and I am here with Beth Howard and we're going to do a Bible study. We're starting the book of Daniel. We'll have six lessons in Daniel. Uh, it's a great study. Uh, you're going to enjoy this book. It's Even though it is uh, Daniel and Ezekiel are, are contemporaries with each other, they, they live in the same place at the same time, you couldn't ask for a more different book than Daniel over Ezekiel. We're in session number eight of the Explore the Bible Winter Series. The title of this lesson is Integrity Established, and we're in Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 21. Mm -hmm. Now, as an overview for the book of Daniel, it can be easily divided into two pretty much uh, equal sections. Uh, this little slide comes from the Bible Project, and by the way, if you're going to teach this lesson, I'd recommend that you take a look at the overview of Daniel in the Bible Project, bibleproject.com, okay, and basically what you're going to find is that in chapters 1 through 6, the first half of Daniel, uh, we have uh, some narrative stories, some stories about faith and one or two about pride. Uh, the challenge of not defiling themselves with food and drink is when Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, decide they don't want to eat the king's food. We're going to study that today. Dreams that are interpreted, dreams uh, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has that Daniel is going to interpret. You remember the story about the fiery furnace where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the furnace and come out uh, without any harm. And then there's a story about Nebuchadnezzar actually becoming like an animal for seven years until his pride is uh, subdued. And then there's Daniel's story of him being thrown into the lion's den. So in all of those six chapters, you've got wonderful narrative stories that we all studied in Sunday school growing up as children. There are some of our favorite stories. And then you get to chapters 7 through 12, and Daniel shifts into end times prophecy. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the visions that God, God gives him, visions of future empires, future kingdoms, future kings, uh, proud and boastful kings and rulers, great wars where many people, both God's people and other people are killed. And then the final victory, the, the war of Armageddon and the forever kingdom that we will have with Jesus as our eternal king. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't, you couldn't ask for more different uh, halves of the book than that, uh, and yet we're going to study both of them. We're going to start in the first four lessons in chapters 1 through 6. Mm -hmm. Integrity established. And uh, the definition of integrity is to have a firm adherence to a code, especially moral code, or to be incorruptible. So if you've got integrity, that means no matter what the temptation is for you to violate your beliefs, you are true to those beliefs. So you can have integrity. Integrity is not terribly common. I mean, most people have integrity to a point, some, uh, some integrity. Okay. I'll give you my story uh, <laughs> that I learned as a, as a 30 year old somebody. Uh, so uh, I worked in an office where one of the people in the office was in financial difficulty and she was having trouble uh, basically making it through uh, the month financially. And so I was eating lunch one day by myself at the McDonald's and they had this game where you would scratch off a little card and you could win instantly, I might add. You could win anything from like an order of French fries all the way up to $500. And so I sit there, I sat there and looked at that card and I said, God, if you will allow me to win $5 with this scratch off thing, I will give it to this woman in my office and that will help her financially. That's not a very big deal, $5. Well, well, back then it was more than $5 today. And then I said, well, I'll one up you, God. If you give me $25, I will, I will give the $25 to her. And then I kind of got this urge and I said, God, if you'll just give me $100 with this scratch off thing, think what a great blessing that would be for her. And then the next thought that went through my head was, God, if you give me the bonus, the big deal, the $500, I can give her $100. And then I stopped and I said, well, at least I knew what my price was. Uh, I was willing to give $100, but when it got to $500, that was more than I was willing to part with. That sounded like real money to me. So 
We all have a certain level of integrity, and we're going to find out today that Daniel and his three friends have super integrity. What are some synonyms and antonyms for this word? Character, synonyms, uh, character, decency, goodness, honesty, morality, righteousness, rightness, uprightness, virtuousness. Uh, the, the opposite of that, I love this word, badness, okay? I guess that's the opposite of goodness. Evil, evil doing, immorality, iniquity, sin, villainy, wickedness. Okay, so now we understand that integrity is something that God values because, let's face it, God has... He is perfect with his integrity, and he would like for us as his children to have our integrity be more than $100. <laughs> Daniel's story actually begins 70 years before his birth. Isn't that interesting? Now, I'll have to tell you most of the story. It's too, too long to read. But if you go back into Isaiah chapter 38, you'll find that the Assyrians were about to take over. They were bringing this huge army. Uh, Sennacherib was bringing this huge army in to conquer Judah. And uh, the king Hezekiah prayed, and God gave the, the Jews a victory over uh, Sennacherib. And then Hezekiah got very ill, but then he prayed that God would give him a few more years, and so now he's back to health. In the meantime, there was a group of people sent from the king of Babylon to wish Hezekiah good health because they had been kind of um, friends before. And while they were visiting, Hezekiah showed them all of the wonderful gold and silver and all the articles in the temple. Yeah, it wasn't a good idea. And so when Isaiah heard that he had done this, Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming, Hezekiah, when all that is in your house, meaning all of your valuables, and that which your fathers have stored up till this day, everything that all of your wealth, that's going to be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. But then he prophesies about Daniel. He says in verse 7, in some of your own sons, Hezekiah, who will come from you, 80 years later, whom you will father shall be taken away, and they shall become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So 70 years before Daniel and his three friends are born is this prophecy that was later, of course, fulfilled from Isaiah. But let me do a little background to, before we get to verse eight. What happens? How do we get? How does Dan, how do how do Daniel and his three friends get to the point where they don't want to eat the king's food? And the the answer comes a little bit earlier, in chapter one, verses three through six. The king of Babylon, that we, we know is Nebuchadnezzar, commanded Ashpenaz. That's his chief eunuch. And from this point forward, he's not called Ashpenaz. He's called the chief eunuch to bring some of the people. This is one of his key leaders here. Some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility. So he told, this is the first time they go in, they take all the valuables out of the, uh, of the king's house. They take a lot of the stuff out of the temple, uh, a lot of the gold, a lot of the silver. And he says, while you're there picking up those valuables, I want you to grab a group of leaders, young men. He says, I want them to be youths, you, and, and the commentaries say probably between the ages of 17 and 19. So we would say today, just right out of high school, without blemish. And these he's very specific. He says, I want you to bring the very best youth in Judah, in Jerusalem. Without blemish, I want them to be handsome, good looking in appearance. I want them to be skillful with all wisdom. In other words, I want to be smart and good looking and endowed with knowledge. Now, remember, they've just got a high school education at this point, but I want them to clearly show signs of being smart, understanding, learning, competent to stand in the king's palace. And this was a big deal because the king was hoping that these young men could be trained to become his advisors at some point in the future as they grew older. So he really wanted them to be highly qualified. And the fact that they were already used to being in the palace or being in a king's presence helped them not feel um, shy or feel embarrassed or feel uncomfortable. They, they were comfortable yeah. with it. You think of Moses with the Pharaoh, okay? Same kind of thing. Stand in the king's palace to teach them 
And I want you to teach them all of our literature and our language. And the language of Babylon and Chaldea at the time was a language called Aramaic. And that may sound familiar to you because Jesus, who really grew up in the Galilee area, that was the primary language of that part of Israel at the time was Aramaic, okay? Jesus knew Greek, he knew Aramaic, and he knew Hebrew, all three, but he primarily chose to speak in the native tongue of the people he grew up with, which was Aramaic, <clears throat> Aramaic the Chaldeans. So the king assigned them a daily portion, now we're getting into the story here, a daily portion of the same food that the king ate. So in other words, he says, I want the very best people, I want them to be good looking, I want them to be really, really smart, and I want them to have the very best and finest food that we can give them. So that his intent was good, that he would give them the very best because he wanted them to be the very best advisors. And he says, I want you to give them the same food that the king ate and the same wine that the king drank. And they were to be educated for three years. You can think of this as, as a college education for these young men. And three years, and at the end of the time, they were then to stand for their final exam before the king. The king was going to inquire of them about a number of different topics and their answers were going to determine whether they made the cut and would become part of the advisory council to the king. So among these men that were being, it wasn't this group of men, we don't know how many, could have been 30, could have been 60, could have been 100, okay? Not all of them were from Israel. Some of them were, we know the four, okay? But they were probably from all over the area were brought in the very best, the very finest to be groomed for these jobs. It says among all these young men that were in this schooling were Daniel, Belteshar was his Babylonian name, Hananiah, Shadrach was his. Now you know the last three mostly by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the tribe of Judah. So these are the four that they brought in from Judah that we know of. And then the other young men that were in this college program, we don't know where they were from, but they were all, I'm sure, equally as qualified at first. So now we're going to get into today's lesson. They get new names. Remember, they've gotten Babylonian names. So, and by the way, the Babylonian names are named slightly after the Babylonian gods, whereas Daniel, the E-L in Daniel's name, okay, was named after God. God judges, okay? <clears throat> so they go from taking God's name to taking the name of a false god, but the, the, the four of them didn't seem to be terribly upset about the fact that they got new names. And okay, now you're going to be educated in everything Babylonian or Chaldean, and they didn't seem to be terribly upset about that. But then when it came time to figure out what they were going to eat, all of a sudden they said, time out. We don't mind the new names. We don't mind being educated in your culture, but... We cannot tolerate eating the foods that you're asking us to eat. We are Jews. We are Israeli, Israelites. We cannot eat those foods. And we're probably talking pork. You're talking all kinds of other foods that offered to gods and stuff. And it was just prohibited. And they knew it from the time they were little until then. They said, we know we can't do that. So Daniel resolved right then and there that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the king's wine and that he drank. Therefore, Daniel asked the chief of the eunuchs, this is the same guy that brought them, selected them and brought them from Jerusalem into Babylon. He asked them, asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him and his friends not to allow him not to defile himself. Please don't make us eat that food. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. In other words, the chief of, at this point, the chief of the eunuchs could have said, sit down, shut up, do what we tell you, okay? And now that brings to mind the story of Esther, who goes before the king, and all he had to do was to say, get out of my sight, and she would have been killed, okay? So now what we're hearing here is that because Daniel takes this stand, God gives him favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, uh, uh, Daniel, you need to understand what you're asking here. He says, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned me to give you this food and drink. He's going to see that when after a few weeks, you're going to look worse than the other youths that are in the program here. He says, if I let you eat this food that you're asking for, 
after a few weeks, you're really going to start looking weak and pale, and, and, and he's going to know that I have violated his order. He said, so would you then endanger my own head with the king by asking me to do this? So then Daniel said to the steward, and then this is the person that was put in charge of um, feeding, taking care of Daniel and his three friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he says, Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over them, test, test your servants. Let's do a science project here. Test your servants for 10 days. Let us just give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Now, I'm, I'm going to get into some commentary in just a minute about this because it sounds a little far-fetched uh, to me to think a 17 and an, or 18-year-old teenager is going to ask this, but they do. Test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables and water to drink. <clears throat> he says, if we pass, we'll eat vegetables the rest of our time here. And if we fail, we're going to eat whatever you ask us to eat. So he says in verse 13, then let our appearance at the end of these 10 days and the appearance of the other youths that are eating the king's food uh, be observed by you. In other words, look at us and look at them and uh, deal with your servants. That's us, the four of us, according to what you see. In other words, if we look like we're okay, or better than the other guys, then we've passed the test and we get to keep eating our vegetables. So, so he, the steward, listened to them in this matter and he tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, it was seen that Daniel and his friends were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. Now, first of all, that is a miracle. That, sure is. that is a miracle. To be fatter eating vegetables and drinking water than kids who are eating red meat and all kinds of other stuff is a miracle because, as you would guess, the caloric intake would suggest that they were going to be fatter than it. But so this is a miracle of God. So the steward took away their king's food and wine and gave them the vegetables to eat for the time that they were in this program. <laughs> as for the few were you now, so here's the rest of the story. God rewards their faithfulness. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Wow. In other words, God not only rewarded them for their stand by giving them favor with the chief of the eunuchs and allowing them to have the vegetables and not defile themselves, but he also rewarded them in terms of giving them really good insight and intelligence for the learning that they were going through. So they wound up being top of their class. At the end of the time, at the end of the three years, when the king had commanded that they, they and that means all of them, not just uh, Daniel and his three friends, but all of the people who had been in the program, commanded that they all should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. This is like their final exam, okay? He spoke with them and all of them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, therefore, they stood before the king. In other words, they passed the test, and now they're going to be advisors to the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them, catch this, wow. he found them not just a little brighter than the other guys, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters were, that were in all of his kingdom. So as they enter into their new jobs of being advisors to the king, every time the king would bring everybody in, all of his advisors in, and ask them about stuff, he would find that the answers from these four men, young men, would be 10 times smarter, better, more intuitive, more accurate than all the other advisors that he had on his entire staff. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, how long was that? Well, we know Nebuchadnezzar and then his son, Belshazzar, and then we know Darius the Mede, and then you know, Cyrus the Persian came in. And then when Cyrus was king, they, Cyrus allowed the Jews, the ones that wanted to go back, to go back to Jerusalem. So for four kings. So what, when we read this story, it's a really cool story. It's really a neat, neat story. But... We need to see what it means, what it meant then, and what it means now. And, and also, we need to spend just a tiny little bit of time on what it does not mean. Okay, and so part of the problem that the Jews had with all Gentiles was that they ate different food. Mm -hmm. 
and they couldn't associate, especially eat dinner with a Gentile. And that was one of the ways the Lord caused the, the, his people, the Jews, to be a separate people because he prescribed for them in the law all these dietary restrictions so that everything had to be prepared a certain way, only certain kinds of foods. And that, for the most part, kept them away from not only the Gentiles, but the culture of the Gentiles. And then they were trying to keep them away from the worship of the foreign gods of the Gentiles. And what happened was they intermarried and that caused that to fall apart. But the whole dietary restriction thing was put in place to keep the cultures separated so that God's people would remain God's people and wouldn't disappear by being you know, commingled with all the other people. We know for sure that Jesus changed all of that because he, he's, he told the Pharisees, he says, he says, you're, okay, up to this point in time, you're absolutely right, but you need to understand it's not what goes into your body that defiles you, it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. So Jesus changed the rule. Now, it wasn't until a little later after the resurrection that Peter is up on the roof and God lowers a sheet down and in the sheet is a whole bunch of animals that the Jews were not allowed to eat. And Peter said, I can't eat those. And God says, if I made them, they're clean. You got to get up and eat. And it was right after that that he gets called to go to minister to the first Gentile Christians. Cornelius. So Cornelius, yeah, the, the uh, centurion. So, so that's what it's not. It's not about you can or you can't eat a certain kind of food, okay? And for those of you who are vegans, uh, it's not that vegetables are necessarily better than meat because later on in chapter 10 of Daniel, Daniel is going to fast from eating red meat and drinking wine. So this happens to be a specific point in the specific part of the specific book of Daniel, okay, that deals with it. Was, and it was a total and absolute miracle. You got to you gotta understand this. So what's unusual? Well, the first point that seems to be a little unusual to me, because I've got a vague memory of having two teenage boys, is any idea that teenage boys would turn down the world's best food for vegetables. Now, that, doesn't that strike a weird chord? You have got to have some type of belief, some kind of faith, some kind of integrity to shun the kind of food that the world would provide. And here we see that we're really not talking about physical food. What we're talking about is food for your soul. Mm -hmm. So it's soul food, not mouth food. When Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, he said, look, you're hungry. You haven't had food in a long time. Why don't you just turn that bread, turn that rock to bread? And Jesus said, you, you don't understand. Man does not live by bread alone. We live by every word, every word that comes out of the word of God. Every word from God's mouth. Is, is, that's how we live. Is, is, and so... Uh, teenage boys turning down the world's best food. Now, you know, a little aside, uh, where I went to college is an engineering school. I probably should have been eating more vegetables, but instead I was eating at a fast food place called the Varsity in Atlanta, and that was the greasiest, uh, most wonderful tasting food still is uh, in the whole world. But that this whole thing explains why I had so much trouble passing calculus. Uh, it, really? Yeah, well, yeah, if all that greasy food probably messed with my head. If I'd gone with vegetables, you I could have. You could have thought better. I could. I would have been more clear-headed. It would have been easier to do. That's it. Yeah, and I didn't really start paying attention until Beverly uh, <laughs> told me that uh, if I didn't get my act together for my grades, that she wasn't going to marry me. And all of a sudden, I went from being on the warning list, uh, dean's warning list, to the to the to dean's list in school. That's what I'm yeah, just, you know, those, it, all of a sudden you get focused. Young people, point number two, uh, that sh uh, point number one is uh, teenage boys turning down the world's best food. It, it shows that they really have a foundation of integrity in their lives. They had grown up believing with all their hearts they that, that they did not want to defile themselves before their God. Young people refusing to let the world defile their relationship with God. Mm -hmm. That's great that this is such a wonderful story about 17, 18 year old boys that have that kind of faith and that kind of commitment. Wow. That is just an amazing thing with me, to me. And what makes it even more amazing is the circumstances that are going on around them. Remember, 
they have just been yanked away from their families, away from their homeland into exile. And then a few years later, uh, 10,000 more of their people come and then they're gonna find out a little bit later that their whole city has been destroyed. So this is a faith that these men have during an exile where they really are wondering whether God cares about them. But that doesn't hinder their faith. They believe with all their hearts that God loves them, he is their God, and he's going to reward their stand for righteousness. And the story of the fiery furnace, the story of the lion's den, and this particular story are all stories that are in the book of Daniel for God to tell his people, I will reward your faith in me. Okay, if we get nothing else out of these stories, that's a story for us to understand no matter what the circumstances in our lives, no matter how difficult the times that we are going through, no matter how many times we're tempted to say, I think my God has abandoned me, no matter what's going on with our lives, God wants us to understand in Daniel that he will reward our faithfulness. <clears throat> Where have we seen this before? Have we, have we, is this the only time we see in the Bible that anything like this, any kind of story like this? No. If you will remember Joseph, who was also an interpreter of dreams, he refuses the advances of Potiphar's wife, knowing that he's going to go to prison. What about when Queen Esther says, I'm going to take the risk to save my people? Rahab, who was a prostitute, hid the spies from Israel and so that she would be saved, she and her family, when Jericho was destroyed. Moses decided, even though he was raised in the palace of the Pharaoh by the Pharaoh's daughter, he decided that he was going to instead choose to suffer with his people. And Abraham chose to leave his own homeland and his family because God invited him to. Where do we see all these stories summarized? And the answer is in Hebrews chapter 11, and it's called commonly the Faith Hall of Fame. And I just read down through there and look what I found in verses 32 through 40. Uh, I do not have time, the writer of Hebrews says, to tell about, and then he goes on and on and on, and then he finishes with the prophets, who through their faith shut the mouth of lions and quenched the fury of the flames. So he's talking about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So what is God saying to Judah? First of all, he's saying in the book of Daniel, he's saying this. When you read this book, I want you to understand that you are in exile from me and your home because you have rebelled against me. You've pursued the world and you rejected me as your God. However, if you'll read carefully in Daniel, you'll see that I promise that I am going to reward those who put their trust in me. What a great message in the book of Daniel to the Jews. But what is God saying to us modern day Christians today? First thing he's saying is this, as Christians, we are God's children, but we live in the world. We live in Babylon, in Egypt. Those, that's what those things represent, is they represent the world around us. Even though we are no longer exiled from God's presence, we are still exiled from his place, and that is heaven. Mm -hmm. And But we look forward by faith to being with him in that eternal home. And we may find ourselves today in a place, whether it's Crystal River or Homosassa or name your town, you may find yourself in a place where we just don't want to be there. Uh, we don't want to be in the situation we're in. We don't want the circumstances that we're currently having to live with. Things seem to be too difficult for us. We want things to be easier in our lives. We just can't see our way through things, but we should do the work that God has assigned right. unto us as unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. Daniel and his three friends would really would rather have been back in Jerusalem at home with their family. And yet we don't read anything about them complaining or whining mm -hmm. or, or any of that. Mm -hmm. They put their minds on becoming the best Chaldean students they could be mm -hmm. with the exception that they weren't gonna defile themselves before God. The world is going to offer tempting fleshly treats, whether it's good food, which is not a bad thing, okay, but it's actually going to offer our souls some bad stuff, and that will, in fact, defile us. But our strength is going to come from God's word. Man does not live by bread alone. And by resisting the world, we learn in Daniel, we're going to gain, I love this, 
not only a little better advantage, but 10 times the wisdom that other people have. And where is this talked about? It's in 1 Corinthians 25, chapter 1, 25 through 27. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Now, this is cool, okay? <laughs> Not many of you were wise, not me. By human standards, not many of you were influential. I certainly am not. Not many of you were of noble birth like Daniel was, okay? But God has chosen you. He's chosen you, the foolish things of this world, to shame the wise things. God has chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And if you read the book of Daniel, what you're going to see is God is going to judge the proud rulers of this world, mm. so that, he says, no one could boast. Mm. He's going to judge pride. He's going to reward faith. My conclusion, action for today. The world is headed for trouble, and Christians are going to face persecution. And I got good news for you. I got bad news for you, because Daniel says it's the end times. God is going to judge everything. God is looking not for whiners and whimpers and victims. He's looking for a Daniel attitude in us. He's looking for the attitude that Paul says. He says, I rejoice in all things. I do. I just rejoice in all things, even though I'm in prison. He's looking for a Daniel, Paul attitude to resist the world's ways, be faithful to God in Jesus Christ. In Christ, we're no longer victims of the exile. We are already reunited with God in our hearts. But until we get to heaven, I want us to remember the only thing that counts is faith, our faith in a loving, merciful God expressing itself through love, Amen. not only of him, but of each other. Pray with me. Father God, what a wonderful Sunday school story, the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refusing to defile themselves with the king's table. Father, help us to see their faith and to want it. Help us to see their faith and to have it. Mm. Father, give us that kind of faith. Give us that kind of food that gives us the wisdom that comes only from you. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in week two of the COVID. <laughs> uh, hopefully, if you're part of our church family in Crystal River, we'll see you in another week. Uh, we're feeling a lot better. Uh, it is just mostly just a head cold at this point in time. But until next week, we're going to take a look at the second story in this wonderful book of Daniel. Till then, stay well, stay healthy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.